Okay, Henry, thank you for the introduction and thank you to our hosts. Um, I'm sorry I will not have time to talk about the bird song today, but I brought all of that with me and I'm happy to talk about it later if you want to catch me. So uh, I'm going to talk today about an application of data assimilation to a kind of weather prediction problem, but in an arena that's much more exotic than those we're all used to. The question I'm going to ask today is, what information must an Earth-based detector receive in order to infer the evolutionary history of cosmological events? And I'm talking about a neutrino detector. And before I get to the data assimilation formulation uh, and the problem, I'm going to spend a little time explaining to you what neutrinos are and try to convince you that you might care. You all might have, be familiar with this image. This is the Crab Nebula. It is a cloud of expanding matter, and it was observed to explode, actually, by the Chinese. There are Chinese records from about, about 10, uh, uh, thousand years ago, noting um, a nova, the creation of a new star in the sky. What they didn't understand then was they weren't looking at a new star being born, they were looking at the death throes, the final death throes of, of a supermassive old star. So let's start way back uh, at, at the guy who created this explosion. Um, supermassive stars, that's actually a technical term for stars that are roughly uh, larger, more massive than 10 times the mass of the sun, um, die in these explosions, these supernova events. Uh, so the sun, the sun is taking four hydrogen nuclei and fusing them into one helium nucleus. This reaction releases energy in the form of light, and that's how we see the star shine. Um, the sun is actually stable against the inward pull, the tremendous inward pull of its own gravity because of the outward force of pressure generated by this fusion. It balances the inward pull of gravity. Stars about 100 times more massive than the sun will be able to fuse, they will be able to um, go beyond helium in a series of fusion events, uh, helium to carbon to oxygen, all the way up to iron. So the elements in the universe uh, between hydrogen and iron are created in the fusion reactions in these stars. Once you get to iron, it is not energetically favorable to go any further. And so you run out of fuel, and you can no longer sustain yourself under gravity. So you collapse rapidly. In one second, you collapse from a radius of about 10 million kilometers down to the radius of the Earth, size of the Earth. This is a white dwarf star. It's supported by electron degeneracy pressure. And the most massive stars uh, can't even support themselves uh, under, uh, under their own weight with electron degeneracy pressure. So in another second, they collapse further to an object of nuclear density, which is roughly the size of the Kyoto region. So you're going, so in two seconds, you collapse from a radius of 10 million kilometers to a radius of about 10 kilometers. 99% of the gravitational binding energy in that collapse is released in the form of neutrinos. I pictured three of them here because neutrinos come in three flavors. We have electron flavor up here new flavor and tau flavor. And those flavors are defined by the way in which each neutrino interacts with matter. And this is important. Um, this gets to why neutrinos are interesting. Uh, for example, an, an electron flavor neutrino can capture on a neutron and produce a proton and an electron. Uh, it got its name electron flavor because it creates an electron in this process. Um, so the neutrinos are setting the neutron to proton ratio in these clouds. And remember, we're at the center here. The supernova is all out here. Um, there's nuclear syn nucleosynthesis going on in the cloud, and it is believed that the elements heavier than iron are created in these events. So the neutrinos are setting the neutron to proton ratio. They are setting what types of elements can be created in these clouds. Now, we can detect neutrinos. Um, not directly. Neutrinos, uh, they interact with matter, but very, very weakly. There are trillions of them going through your body every second. Uh, so you can't just reach out and grab one. What you do is th there are various designs of neutrino detectors, but I'm showing you this one that's right here in Japan. Uh, if you don't know this, Japan is the world's leader in neutrino detection. This is a giant tank of water. It's a cylinder of about 40 meters radius. 
And these are photo tubes that detect uh, light radiated from relativistic electrons during uh, the reaction I just showed you. So what you're looking at is uh, the neutrino comes in and interacts with the oxygen atoms in this water, excites the oxygen atoms, and electrons are released. That's how this, this contraption is designed. Um, so the question that I'm focusing on today is, what, is this the best design we've got? What need we measure in order to understand how the neutrino flavor evolved uh, backwards in time from when we observed it at our detector all the way back to the supernova event? And importantly, neutrinos can change their flavor. We know this from the lab. So about three years ago, I was working in Henry Barbonell's group on data simulation methods, and um, a former professor of mine from uh, the astrophysics department came to me and said, um, what is data optimization? And I said, what? And he said, well, this, whatever you do with Henry, and I said, data simulation? He said, yes, yes. And I, I explained to him, and he said, um, do you have to integrate forward or backward in time? And I said, you don't have to. You can formulate the uh, optimization problem in such a way that you do not have to do that. And he said, OK, great. Because we've got, uh, we've got a problem here. Uh, typically, in this field, the way they solve a problem is they start with a set of initial conditions at a detector, and they integrate backwards, simple numerical integration. Now, this works fine. This is a cartoon representation of the scenario I just took you through. Uh, so let me familiarize you with it. This is the surface of ne the neutrino sphere from which the neutrinos are emitted from this cosmological event. And there are two of them pictured here. Um, in reality, there's really more like 10 to the 58, but we're going to say two. And they propagate outwards to our detector where we're able to measure the flavor of each of them. The question is, what happened back then? How did the flavor evolve along this trajectory? Now, uh, if this is a simple forward scattering problem, that is no direction changing scattering, no energy changing scattering, then there's no problem here. We can start with these initial conditions and integrate backwards, problem solved. This is the equation of motion governing the density operator, rho, which tells you how the flavor of neutrinos evolves uh, in R, where R is the distance from the neutrino sphere. Uh, this uh, H here, this is a Hamiltonian, smooth Hamiltonian. So really, this equation is just x dot equals f of x, where f is smooth and continuous, and you know, it, you know its form, fine. The problem is it's not that simple. You can have a neutrino interacting with the neutrino out here and changing its direction. And sometimes you, you can get zigzags here in R before the neutrino finally winds up in your detector. Or um, in other words, states that later, flavor states at later times can affect states at earlier times. And this can significantly affect the evolution of flavor within the envelope. So now what? That's the problem that my colleagues at UCSD came to us with. So um, can data simulation help? Can we formulate it in an integration blind manner um, in order to solve this problem? There are a couple other advantages of DA uh, over numerical integration. One is that uh, the way they typically solve their problems in astrophysics is uh, brute force uh, integrating, oh, a million times over a huge parameter space, which may have regions uh, that are probably unlikely to be relevant to your problem. So uh, DA may significantly cut down on the computational expense there. So here is the problem that we gave to DA. This is a first step to ascertain whether DA can be useful in this arena. Importantly, for a first step, we choose a boring, simple problem that we already know the answer to. Uh, the one that I introduced you to, the case of simple forward scattering that can be solved with numerical integration so that we know the answer. And we want to challenge DA to give us that answer back. Uh, so we have a two-flavor model for simplicity. We have uh, electron-flavored neutrinos and X-flavored. X is not a flavor, but we've crammed uh, the mu and the tau flavor into X because at these energies, those states are too heavy to be relevant. So we're really only focusing on the electron flavor, whether we're electron flavor or not. Um, and this is the same graphic I showed you a few moments ago where we've got two uh, beams, nu, nu1 and nu2, with different energies 
interacting with each other. So we have a matter, I'm sorry, uh, a, a new, new potential, coupling potential. And then each of them interacts with the, I'm sorry, I may have said that, let me make sure I say that clearly. The neutrinos interact with each other. So there's a new, new coupling potential here. And each neutrino interacts with the surrounding matter, the neutrons, protons, electrons. So we have a uh, V-matter coupling potential. Uh, let me explain to you how uh, the flavor uh, evolves in this very simple scenario. Uh, PZ, that is the Z component of the polarization vector. Each neutrino is described by PX, PY, and PZ. Each neutrino has three state variables. We can measure one of them, PZ. And uh, for our purposes today, uh, if PZ is 1, we're purely new E flavor. And if PZ is negative 1, we're purely new X. Uh, theory predicts that most of the neutrinos are emitted as electron flavor from the neutrino sphere. And uh, let me orient you on the x-axis. This is the radius from neut the neutrino sphere from 0 out to our detector. That should not be a 0. That should be a 2 on this scale. Um, in the adiabatic limit, and by that I essentially mean um, the neutrinos do not change their energy as they propagate outwards. What you get somewhere within the cloud, and, and here this, this uh, epoch in radius is contained within the uh, supernova envelope or the cloud, we call it the envelope. Uh, there is some location uh, where the neutrinos undergo extremely efficient conversion from, from new E to new X. And one important question for understanding the physics uh, going on within this cloud is where does that occur? Where is that? So we thought, okay, that's a nice simple question for DA. Let's start there. Um, <clears throat> specifically, here's what we do. The measurements that we give the procedure, the measurements are the PZ, the value of PZ uh, for each neutrino at the neutrino sphere. We assume we know that. And at our detector. That's it. Nowhere in between, because I don't think anytime soon we'll be able to build a contraption that can bring us into the supernova envelope and put our detector in a more convenient location. Um, and we challenge the DA procedure to tell us what happened in the middle, predict the middle, in particular where this uh, transition happens. Um, we have two sets of experiments. Uh, each defined by the relative ratio of energies of these two neutrinos. Uh, one in which the neutrinos have very similar energy, the ratio is 2.5, and one in which they have very disparate energies, the ratio is 0 0.01. And then for each of those two, we have four versions uh, where the coupling strength between the neutrinos uh, is increased zero, from 0 to 1 to 100 to 1,000. Why these numbers? We want to uh, explore many different parameter regimes here. We want to see where DA works, where it doesn't, uh, what it can tell us in, in these different arenas. OK. I'm first going to show you the result using the, energy the, the small energy ratio of 2.5. The neutrinos have very similar energy. And within uh, this radius epoch, they both feel the matter potential quite strongly. So on uh, the left column, this is neutrino 1 down here. This is neutrino 2 on the right. And the rows show increasing coupling strength between the neutrinos. Uh, C nu nu equals 0 at the top, 1, 100, and 1,000. The blue trajectory is the true solution that you get from numerical integration. And the red is the, the DA solution. So one general comment is that the overall evolution is traced quite well by the data assimilation procedure. Um, there are some fast, very fast, high frequency oscillations that are not captured very well. Um, and I contrast this regime with the regime for the disparate energy ratio of uh, 0.01. Uh, so again, we have neutrino 1 on the left and neutrino 2 on the right. And in this regime, neutrino 1 feels the matter potential. Neutrino 2 does not feel the matter potential strongly. It's highly energetic. It's, just go it's going to essentially zip through the matter without interacting. Um, so I always show this slide. I know it's not customary to show a slide in which your result failed spectacularly. 
but I always show it because I think it's interesting to look at the regime where, uh, so you measure PZ of neutrino 2 at the neutrino sphere and at the detector. Um, <clears throat> but in this regime, neutrino 2 is coupled strongly to neither the matter nor neutrino 1. And uh, I'm not telling you anything you don't already know, but one reason why DA works is that you seek to measure the state variables that uh, will result in efficient energy transfer. You want to squeeze as much information out of the measured state variables uh, and propagate them through your equations of motion to solve the full model. That's not going to happen if you uh, measure a state variable that's not communicating with anybody else. So this is an illustration of how we're, we're oh, but then it, once you crank up the coupling potential between neutrinos to a high enough level, then you start getting a solution for neutrino two. This is relevant to, our, to an actual problem because one question we would like to, to answer is um, measure one neutrino at your detector. Is that going to tell you anything about the, other, the unmeasured neutrinos that this guy has interacted with along its path? Okay, uh, so just to summarize uh, what we found, for six out of the eight experiments, the uh, evolutionary history was traced quite well, except for those two cases where we had uh, poor uh, information transfer from uh, the measurements to the model. Um, let me explain to you now, I'm going to skip this, and explain what this procedure is. Um, I'm going to show you the end state of the cost function. I won't derive it. Uh, it's in three terms. The first uh, is what we call a measurement error. It's a least squares form. The y sub l are the measurements and the x sub l, this is the path that you're solving for. Uh, the sum on l is the sum on your measured state variables. So we have two, pz of neutrino 1 and pz of neutrino 2. Over here, we uh, permit error in the model. And the sum on a is the sum over all state variables, measured and unmeasured, px, py, pz of neutrino 1 and end of neutrino 2. And the third term here um, is an error. Uh, we impose unitarity this way. We say we begin with two neutrinos and we end with two neutrinos. Neutrinos are not created or destroyed. A few specifics of the procedure. Um, again, the optimization is performed at all time points simultaneously. That was the point. That's why we, we uh, began this collaboration in the first place. And to seek a global minimum on the surface of a non-convex cost function, what we do is an iterative reweighting of the measurement and the model terms. Uh, what we do is start with um, Rm and Rf. For our purposes, are just reweighting terms; they're coefficients. And we start off assuming that Rm for the measurement error is much, much greater than Rf. Rf might even be zero. We're ignoring the model. Uh, so in this space, we have a smooth surface, and the idea is find uh, the minimum there first. Then we crank up the weight of RF slightly, weakly impose the model constraints, calculate the cost function value again, uh, crank up and repeat and repeat and repeat. And the idea is that you stay close enough to the true minimum so that you don't fall off into a local minimum as the surface becomes increasingly well resolved. <clears throat> Sorry, my voice is failing me. Uh, we use the variational approach to minimization. Uh, it's also been couched uh, as a, a Monte Carlo method. Um, and we use the open source interior point optimizer, which is freely available online. Henry's students created the interface to work with it. Uh, what's up next for the neutrinos plan? Um, we want to retain our independent consistency check for a bit longer to flesh out um, the model uh, in terms of uh, the realisticness of these potentials that we created. Uh, I showed you two numbers, our, our, so we're estimating two parameter values, the strength of the matter potential and the strength of the new new coupling potential. Uh, really, these are much more complicated numbers. You have to consider the uh, electron density within the cloud, how that fluctuates as you travel outwards. So we want to uh, flesh out the model uh, <clears throat> in those terms. And we also, as I said before, we would like to determine how much information we can squeeze out of the measurement of one neutrino whether that will tell us anything about the unmeasured neutrinos in the field that interacted with that. Okay, I think I've timed this pretty perfectly. Uh, ultimately, the point is 
to add to the problem uh, reflecting surfaces, add backscattering, make this a problem that cannot be solved with numerical integration. And at that point, trust our DA procedure enough to let it lead us blind and hopefully uncover new physics that we don't yet know about. All right. That's all. Thank you.